So this presentation is going to provide you with some scenarios to help you regarding the assisted dying terminology. And also we're going to give you a brief overview of the law in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. So I'm going to start going through these scenarios with you and then I'll hand over to Alex who will talk to you about the law in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. We've put these scenarios together to assist you by offering some realistic situations which involve the different forms of assisted dying. What the scenarios aren't designed to do is to provide you with more specific information, like for instance, what would make someone eligible for an assisted death, depending on the particular law that's in place. And the ethical and the moral issues that these scenarios raise will be the focus of later jury sessions. So this first scenario that you can see here involving Jane is one which relates to euthanasia. Here we have a patient Jane who's repeatedly asked her doctor to end her life. So this is a case of voluntary euthanasia. Whilst the scenario doesn't explicitly say that Jane is terminally ill, she's not receiving relief from her pain and suffering through the treatment that she's getting. What is done here to end Jane's life which is the lethal dosage of dimorphine, is done by the doctor. So Jane plays no part in the act which causes her death. And this is what makes this an instance of euthanasia rather than assisted suicide. Turning to our second scenario, this involves physician assisted suicide or PAS, P-A-S for short. The crucial difference as you read through this scenario between this scenario with Jack and the previous one with Jane is that Jack here is involved in the act which causes his death. The doctor assists him by providing the means, the barbiturate pills, but it's Jack who takes the pills. So this is an instance of assisted suicide where the physician assists Jack to die. And then our next scenario, scenario three, is also an instance of assisted suicide. But here we have a patient, Daisy, as you'll see, who needs more than just a physician, a doctor to help her. She's suffering from paraplegia, so she's completely paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, no prognosis is that there's not gonna be any improvement in her condition. So she con contacts a right to die organization such as Dignitas in Switzerland and begins this process of assisted dying. And obviously this is gonna take some time because the, in Switzerland they'll need to get her medical records from whichever country that she's in. And she'll need someone to accompany her to travel over to Switzerland with her on the, the flight. So her husband is, is agreed to pay for the flights and accompany her. So she goes to Switzerland, she's given pills, as Jack was, she's given pills by a nurse in this instance, and she swallows this with water, Daisy swallows it with water, and she dies. So what differentiates Daisy's situation from Jack's is the necessary involvement of somebody else besides the nurse, the doctor, besides the nurse here, Jack, uh, her, her husband. And the scenario initially occurs in a country in which assisted suicide is unlawful because, of course, she needs to travel abroad to obtain the assisted death that she wants. So this is an instance of nurse and relative assisted suicide. And then finally, our fourth scenario, we wanted to provide you with a situation to illustrate an instance of medical behaviour which leads to the patient's death but that normally isn't included in the assisted dying terminology. So here we have a patient, Daniel, who is diagnosed as being in the vegetative state. So that means he has no conscious awareness and the prognosis that, they've been, the, that the patient has been given, family, the family of the patient, is that it's a permanent condition. Daniel's receiving clinically assisted nutrition and hydration. Both the team, the medical team that's caring for Daniel and his family agree that it's not in Daniel's best interest to continue to receive treatment and his treatment is withdrawn. Daniel dies as a result of that. What happens to Daniel here in terms of the withdrawal of the treatment that's keeping him alive is considered by some to be an instance of, of passive euthanasia. But in contrast to assisted dying, this is accepted medical practice in many countries throughout the world. 
Daniel dies as a result of a pre-existing condition, the vegetative state. And treatment is withdrawn because everyone agrees that it's not in his best interest to continue to receive it. So there are our four scenarios, which hopefully will help to further clarify the assisted dying terminology. I'm now going to hand over to Alex, and Alex is going to set out the legal position in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Thank you, Suzanne. So this is essentially a small lesson in criminal law, so I hope you find it useful. Both assisted suicide and euthanasia are unlawful, and both are serious crimes in the UK. The law I'm going to tell you about applies in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but not Scotland, as they have their own laws, but they also do prohibit both assisted suicide and euthanasia. So first of all, euthanasia. Euthanasia is murder in English law because murder is defined essentially as killing another person intentionally. So because active euthanasia is intentionally killing, it is unavoidably regarded as murder from a legal perspective. Murder carries a mandatory life sentence, so anyone convicted will be given a life sentence, although the actual term or the tariff imposed will reflect the circumstances. The circumstantial difference between a violent murder and euthanasia, such as the um, scenario provided by Suzanne um, with the situation with Jane and the doctor administering a lethal injection to end, end Jane's suffering um, is not actually legally relevant because the law takes no account of either the motive of the, um, the killer, the doctor in that case, or indeed the consent or request of the victim, Jane in that case. So it doesn't make any difference if the victim requested the euthanasia in order to escape her suffering. It doesn't make any difference if the doctor was only motivated by compassion because both factors are irrelevant under the law on murder. Although having said that, the circumstances um, in which you know, the motivation was, you know, in, in the eyes of many people at least, compassionate, um, would, would be reflected in the sentence imposed. So the doctor, for example, would get a shorter sentence in comparison to other convicted murderers. Moving on to the law in England, Wales and Northern Ireland um, on assisted suicide. The Suicide Act um, 1961 prohibits assisting or encouraging the suicide or attempted suicide of another one. Now this act at the time decriminalized attempting to kill oneself, but it made it clear that it was an offense to assist in the suicide of another person. On conviction, the maximum sentence is 14 years, but convictions are very rare indeed. And you can see here some of the data. So in an 11 year period, um, 2009 to 2020, 162 cases were referred to the Crown Prosecution Service. Of these, 107 were not preceded. That means they dropped the investigation and the prosecution. 32 were withdrawn. That means the same, but at a slightly later um, case stage. There were three convictions one acquittal and nine cases were referred on for other serious crimes such as homicide because when they investigated it it would have um, been apparent that there was something far more sinister going on um, and there are seven ongoing cases at the moment and, and that data is available on the Crown Prosecution Service website. So I just want to tell you um, a little bit about um, the policy and practice of um, the authorities in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, because this has been um, a, a key issue really in shaping the response um, and the evolution of the law. And it's been crucial in establishing a form of compromise, which means that while assisting the suicide is unlawful, it's very unlikely that a compassionate assister would actually be prosecuted. 
Whenever any crime is investigated, if there's sufficient evidence to support a realistic prospect of conviction, police and prosecutors have to decide whether it's in the public interest to prosecute. And this is a discretionary question in which prosecutors essentially decide whether a suspect deserves to be held accountable by the criminal law. Several years ago, a woman called Debbie Purdy brought a human rights case against uh, the British uh, state, arguing that people affected by the law on assisted suicide had no idea how the discretion was exercised and which circumstances would lead to a prosecution. She won that case um, on the basis that her human rights were uh, violated by the vagueness of the law. And as a result of that, an offence specific prosecution policy was created to guide people and prosecutors about the public interest decision and how that discretion is exercised. And so now we have a policy which sets out um, public interest factors tending in favor of prosecution and public interest factors tending against prosecution. There's quite a long list of these. So I've just given you a sort of key snippet here. So for example, if the victim was under 18, or they lacked mental capacity, or they hadn't reached a clear or settled decision to die, it's more likely that a person assisting in that suicide would be prosecuted. Similarly, if the suspect pressured the victim to commit suicide, or there was evidence that they were not wholly motivated by compassion, that would also suggest that that person should be prosecuted. And then finally, factors tending against prosecution would be if it was very clear that the victim had reached a voluntary, clear and settled decision to commit suicide, and if the suspect appeared to be wholly motivated by compassion and they sought, for example, to dissuade the victim from taking their own life and they provided only minor assistance, this would also um, suggest that it wasn't in the public interest to prosecute that particular person. So that's, that's um, our overview of some of the scenarios and the law in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. I hope you found it helpful and we're very happy to answer questions um, during the um, meeting. Thank you. Thank you.